Okay, great. Hi, everyone. It's really great to be here. This is really fun. Thanks for the organizers for putting this whole series together. Um, so I am really grateful today to be able to talk about the critical role of SDO in support of a topic that is quite um, dear to me, which is the development of next generation solar observations, particularly for the corona. Um, and as Dan said, SDO has really set a formidable stage um, for what we need to focus on next. And I will try to give this topic um, just a small slice of the attention it deserves uh, in the next few minutes that we have together. So let's see. All right, um, I'm gonna approach this from the sounding rocket instrument perspective since that is a cornerstone of a lot of the work that our group at Marshall has been strategically building up over the past decade. But of course there are a plethora of programs that support this type of research and development uh, that are just as valuable. Um, but NASA has been utilizing sounding rockets for several decades now to cost effectively develop and test next generation instrumentation and to produce cutting edge science. Um, and they are also an excellent pathway for training the next generation of instrumentalists, including myself at this point. So sounding rockets are inherently short duration rides, only about 15 minutes total, so you get about five minutes of science. But they allow us to test high risk technologies and science in the relevant environment conditions. Um, so in fact, without this high risk posture of the sounding rocket program, our ability to do cutting edge uh, research and science on flagship missions uh, such as SDO um, would be severely constrained. Today I'm going to focus on the coronal component observed in the EUV with the high C payloads, um, and that's because they're very strongly tied to the SDO observations. Um, high C is the high resolution coronal imager that has been managed through Marshall with several strong partnerships, particularly with SAO. Um, but this type of instrument has broad application and even level of implementation into several programs and other missions at this point. Uh, so the purpose of this talk is to use this critical technology development case as an example to emphasize how key SDO is in partnering with these programs. Um, HiC is capable of extremely high spatial resolution of the corona. So we're going to go from the big things in the corona that Dan and Cooper spoke of down to the very, very small. And we have tested these observations in two different wavelengths so far and are set to test a third in 2024. Um, but to achieve such high resolution, the fields are, the field of views are very small. So that makes SDO necessary for establishing not only spatial context, but also the connectivity between regions and structures. Next slide, please. All right. Oh, yes. Um, so the first high sea flight took place in the summer of 2012 and captured active region 11520 shown here in the AIA 193 channel, which matches the high sea band pass and gives us a nice view of the 1 and 10 megakelvin corona. It was a gorgeous region um, that was significantly evolved by this point but it was large and rather complicated. So the connectivity outside of the high sea field of view would have been nearly impossible to disentangle without AIA and HMI. So the movie at right was put together by Amy Weinberger for a nature publication um, to highlight the remarkable improvement in spatial resolution for these uh, particular coronal observations. And you can see how much substructure there really is compared to AIA in the moss, um, the outflow regions, the core loops, and even in the transient brightenings, which is shown here in the movie. This movie is also available on the HiSea website, which is shown at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. So there were 26 science publications that have come out of that five minutes of data, which is pretty incredible including one published just this past year by Jim Klimchuk and Craig DeForest on flux tube cross sections, which I'll mention later in this talk. Um, the primary release described braided loops triggering energy release through reconnection. 
uh, which is shown in the top left panel of the figure. But it's important to note that that result was heavily reliant on the AIA observations that provided the evolution of that region before and after the rocket flight, as did several of the other publications here. Uh, so along with the spatial context, SDO provides very important temporal context for these flights as well, because again, we only get five minutes of data. Next slide, please. Okay, so for the second flight, the mirror was recoded for the 172 angstrom band pass, and that's to target the cooler temperature plasma in spicules and active region core loops. Uh, this change was combined with a significant improvement in camera quality noise and a broad range of external coordinations since IRIS had also been launched by this time. Next slide, please. So as an aside, High c 2 flew in 2016, but there was a camera shutter failure. So fortunately, we were able to quickly refly in that configuration in 2018. And we were extremely lucky to get another nicely developed active region shown here with AIA. And I just wanna note here how key SDO, <clears throat> particularly AIA is even for pre-launch activities, uh, as we need to monitor last minute solar conditions for pointing of our tiny little field of view, as well as making observational adjustments, um, such as adjusting our exposure durations. With only five minutes of data at most, uh, every second spent adjusting on the fly is a second of science data lost. So we greatly appreciate that coordination and that um, opportunity. Rocket teams do not take SDO for granted. I will say that for sure. Next slide. So here is a zoomed in region of that field of view as seen with AIA-171. Uh, next slide, please. And here is that same region as seen with high c 2.1. So it's a lot like putting in your contacts. It really does have a lot of clarity there. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And this slide is showing the high c movies of the active region. You can see some nice brightenings popping off in the core region in the field of view on the left. And that's the full field of view. And, oops. No, can you? Go back up to the movie, please. So they should be playing. <laughs> it should, it, they're very stable. Um, and in the inset at right showing the diffuse region, we can see very fine strands and low emission substructures that are surprisingly dynamic. Um, and this is thanks in part to a large part to the low noise camera that we're able to see it. It's such an incredibly crisp view of the corona, even at these very small scale zoomed in. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay, so there are seven science publications so far using th this data set, and I want to briefly highlight a few of them uh, that are particularly connected to the SDO observations. Uh, note that these are all listed on the HiC website for easy reference. Um, and shown here is a figure from Tuari et al. that explored very fine scale explo uh, explosive energy release locations within the active region core. And their findings suggest that these brightenings originate in the transition region and or the chromosphere, and that most of the events are indeed driven by flux convergence and cancellation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this one by Panasar et al. traced uh, the evolution of jetlets at the edges of magnetic network. And you can see the topological evolution of this particular miniature transient from having two spikes in the AIA channel along the top row um, to being a single structure in high C in that middle panel. So the magnetic boundaries are captured by HMI along the bottom. And I just wanna note that these are extremely tiny scales in the corona that we're focusing on for these studies. Next slide, please. And I want to spend a little extra time on this result, which was previewed by Dan earlier. <clears throat> and this is by Williams et al. Um, and that since it addre addresses a really key question as to wh whether or not we are resolving coronal strands with I A AIA or high C. And they do this by comparing the regions that are labeled in this figure on the AIA and HMI figures. Um, and they contain different features to what is seen in high C. Next slide, please. 
So here is a diffuse outflow fan, re uh, fan region uh, shown with AIA on the top and high C on the bottom. And you can see three faint artificial slits that they use to derive an intensity time profile. Um, and that's shown in the middle column. And then they applied a background subtraction technique uh, to pr produce a detrended profile in the far right column. Um, the red line on the plot is measured from AIA while the black is from high C. And you can see very clearly that there is indeed substructure seen by the higher resolution instrument compared to AIA in this span, <clears throat> particularly in the top two slits. Uh, next slide, please. Similar results are found throughout the field of view. And this is another example of a large arch loop system. You can see that there's a lot of substructure in that far right column seen in high C. Next uh, slide, please. And the lower boundary outflow region um, also shows this uh, trend. Although note that the top slit profile here shows more consistency between AIA and high C, but the bottom profile is wildly different. Next slide, please. And this is a, a nice summary of the strand size distribution. High C is shown in gray and AIA is in pink. Uh, the takeaway here is that AIA is not resolving all of the structures, but this analysis can't really conclude whether high C is resolving the strands either. So next slide, please. So the team did a follow on analysis, fitting the high C intensity profiles with multiple Gaussian profiles. And they actually based this method off of the recent high C one paper by Klimchuk and DeForest, um, <clears throat> which concluded that the loop cross sections appear to be uniform along the loop. Next slide. And they conclude from this analysis that most of the Gaussian width profiles do fall within the range measurable by high C. Don't be fooled by the pink here. These are actually high C widths, um, not AIA. It's just a different publication and they've zoomed in on the, the frequency diagrams for high C. All right, next slide, please. So the next obvious direction to take high C and so many other solar instruments is to optimize them for setting flares. Um, the most, but most solar sounding rockets have been flown out of the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico, which has necessarily tight constraints that limit rocket launches to a, a strict one hour window. <clears throat> and the consequence of this inflexibility is the inability to test instrumentation that's optimized for solar flare observations because you simply cannot expect to catch one. Next slide. So a pioneering solar flare sounding rocket campaign has just been enabled at the Poker Flat Research Range in Fairbanks, Alaska, following a site, a site study by the program office. Um, Poker Flat was chosen because it can handle two large and two small rockets at nearly the same time, which is really exciting. Um, and they routinely coordinate launches that sit and wait for suitable science conditions through their auroral studies. Uh, the launches are not constrained by competing range activities and land recovery is standard practice rather than launching these expensive instruments that could be reflown into the bottom of the ocean. Next slide, please. The first announcement of opportunity, including a flare campaign was opened in 2019. And we are really excited to announce that two payloads were selected specifically for the pilot, uh, which is High C Flare and Foxy 4, which both have extensive sounding rocket heritage. And an additional new build payload, SNFs, was selected from the overall call and has been recently brought into the campaign due to its significant um, complementarity. And Phil Chamberlain, which I hope is on this call, has promised to make a nice logo for this soon, hopefully in time for SPD. Three minutes. Um, Okay, high C flare consists of a reflight of the high, high resolution coronal imager, but with the mirror recoded for a hotter band pass, uh, the 129 angstrom uh, wavelength. And this will detect flare plasma at around 11 megakelvin. Uh, there are also two new instruments that have been added to complement high C, an EUV slitless spectrograph and a high cadence disk integrated soft X-ray imager. So think um, a very fast goes. These EUV and soft X-ray instruments will observe small scale 
coronal dynamics and uh, detect non-thermal broadenings in the hot iron 21 line over the entire flare region. And so these ob observations are hoping to target sources of turbulence, um, particle acceleration, and also heating. FOXY4 consists of a reflight of its high resolution direct imaging hard X-ray telescope, as well as the um, soft X-ray photon counting imager named Phoenix. And they've made improvements to incre increase the resolution and dynamic range um, to optimize capturing bright flare sources. And so this combination of hard and soft X-ray images um, can hopefully distinguish between thermal and non-thermal flare sources, which would allow focused hard X-ray measurements of flare foot points, which has never been done before. So that's really exciting. And the SNFs payload is an integral field spectrograph designed to observe the dynamics of the chromosphere. And the use of this type of spectrograph on SNFs has the potential to provide unprecedented observations of the mass and energy transfer between the chromosphere and the lower corona during a flare. Next slide, please. So these launches will be like no other, um, though, since we will need to coordinate flare prediction methods and incorporate those into decision trees for our go, no go verdicts. Um, so not only will SDO be critical for data analysis after the flight, it will also be crucial for monitoring social, uh, solar conditions and eruption predictions prior to the launch. So this is really exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. <clears throat> we have some efforts underway to determine the best real time flare prediction data sets based on the flare parameters that the participating instruments actually need, like size of flare and the duration. And we will be planning practice campaigns based on real data with homemade rockets. So if you have ideas that you think would be helpful for the campaign, we'd be really glad to hear them um, and to work with you. Or you can even just uh, join us virtually with your own homemade Estes rockets for our launch practices. We'd love to get everybody involved with this. Next slide, please. And so I will conclude by saying that the combination of these measurements along with critical coordinated data sets promises to provide really extraordinary comprehensive insight into flare dynamics thanks to the risk posture of the sounding rocket program really. And this paradigm provides a new pathway for developing the next generation of solar flare instrumentation, but it really does rely on continued, uh, continued coordination with SDO for spatial and temporal context, calibration, flight assessments and adjustments, and uh, now even real-time flare prediction input. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions now. <laughs>